This is episode 20 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. So if somebody came to you and said, give us four or five of the most important history books I could read. You mean most important or favorites? Well, the, the, the different. If you say, if you know, if somebody said, "Tell me five, give me five books that I need, I should read." Well, if I, I mean, and I'm interested and I, in history, and I'm okay. starting, and, and I, I tell you, um, the and the choice is random, but it's in large part what I said earlier. You learn to write by reading, and and what I'm gonna, uh, what the books I recommend are is are all great literature. Um, William Manchester, uh, in my view is unmatched. His biography, Douglas MacArthur, I think, is the single finest um, biography that I've ever read. And I know there are experts who take issue with some of the scholarship, but paragraph for paragraph, Manchester manages to write, it's, it, it's ornate without ever becoming purple, it's it's never extravagant, but it's lush. Uh, it's it's just it's just a remarkable use of language. So, um, two, okay. Um, his Churchill, I would say, the first two volumes, um, Visions of Glory and Alone, which take the story up to 1940, and then sadly he became ill. Um, he written about a hundred thousand words on the last volume, which was called Defender of the Realm, which was to take Churchill through his death. And then he died. He was going to, there were stories that he destroyed. You're talking the, about Manchester. Manchester, book, yeah. Manchester became ill. Um, and, and in the end, um, they settled on, a, uh, on a, a, another writer uh, from the Palm Beach. Paul, Paul, Paul Reed. Post. Yeah. Who, I mean, I, I, you know, boy, I don't envy him. I mean, he, he to take on... But but anyway, he completed the series. But the first two volumes, literally, you will not be able to put down. Huey Long, uh, biography by T. Harry Williams. T. Harry Williams of LSU is that rarity. Um, An absolutely world-class scholar, an academic who, pardon me, doesn't write like an academic. And I mean by that, who doesn't write exclusively for other academics. Um, and of course, I mean, Wong is a great subject. But T. Harry Williams had the imagination. Uh, he had the luck. The timing was perfect. Wong, of course, left almost no papers. So Williams pioneered in the, in the very young and suspect discipline of oral history. Almost all of that book is based on oral history. What that meant was, Williams had to get to all of those folks, hundreds of them, you know, who had been around Huey, who were part of Louisiana politics, get them to talk honestly um, before it was too late. And the result is is mesmerizing. Next book. Gosh. You want nonfiction. You want history. Yeah. Okay. I think it appears. Well, um, <laughs> okay. Alan Nevins, The Ordeal of the Union, which is eight volumes, and it's the quickest reading eight volumes you'll ever encounter. I mean, it's, it's, um, Nevins again is in some ways a throwback. Um, he, he just, he writes like a dream. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a whole where, different language. Where is he based? Um, well, he, I think he was at Columbia. But again, he write, you know, he has, I mean, I hate to use this term, there's a journalistic immediacy, but, but just plain a great literary grace. Um, and again, you think about, uh, you want to read volumes about Zachary Taylor and the, the internal politics and the compromise of 1850, and in the abstract, you'd say no. But it's 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 Nevin's gift to make you care 
about these people, um, and and to want to and to want to relive their experience. It's it's just had to me. I mean, Shelby Foote is extraordinary, deserves all the praise. But I mean, um, if you want to read the ultimate life and times, the war and what preceded the war that made the war inevitable, the ordeal of the Union. One more. Let me do something contemporary, because, well, I think, um, you know, there are lots of wonderful presidential biographers. Um, I've never read a more readable, and I won't just say one volume, the first volume, the Edmund Morris's Theodore Roosevelt trilogy, I think stands alone. Um, and each of the three books is different. It's really interesting. Uh, because I think each of them reflects different aspects of Edmund and Edmund's life. Um, I've often thought I think of Edmund as a as a romantic, and I mean that as a as a compliment. I think he was born to write the rise of Theodore Roosevelt, which is talk about energy and a young man's enthusiasm. And he was a young man then, and he could, he inhabited T.R.'s life, and and he had and has. Is a remarkable gift for narrative history. Um, it's 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 just you know it's just an extraordinary book. And then a long time went by while he did the unfortunate Reagan book, and he put off the second volume, which dealt with T.R.'s presidency. And I remember the first time I read because I reread them periodically. Uh, the first time I read Theodore Rex, which is the name of the second volume, I wasn't disappointed. You, you know, Edmund is incapable of writing a disappointing book, but it was it was different. It was clearly different from the. And I thought to myself, and I'm overanalyzed, but I thought to myself, this is a man who's experienced disappointments, whose romanticism has been in some ways scarred by. By experience, and I and I wondered if the you know the experience of the Reagan book, which must have been very difficult, um, in any event. But I've gone back more recently, and you know, and I thought, well, you know what, this is it is different. It's a different. He's writing about a different man, Theodore Roosevelt in office, operating in the constrictions of office. Even T.R., who is this larger-than-white figure who spills over the, the boundaries of, of, the, of the page, um, nevertheless has to um, adapt himself to the institutions of government. And I don't think Edmund is... Edmund retains enough of the romantic that I think he finds writing about institutions, particularly government institutions, I don't think he is intrinsically drawn to the processes of modern government. Um, and yet, you know, you go back and read that book, and it's every bit as, as fine as the first volume. And then you come to the last volume, uh, which is called Colonel Roosevelt, and it's very different. It's um, a somber, uh, almost um, elegiac um, it's a book about mortality. It's a book about decay. It's a book about the denial. How, how does a man deal with the loss of what he values most? Power, in T.R.'s case. Um, it leaves a void. How does he fill that void? How does he cope? How does he evolve? Does he evolve? Does he become a tragic figure? Um, does he become in some ways almost a caricature of ambition? Uh, all of those things. I mean, it's a very rich portrait. It seems to me, I, I think of, of Edmund as someone who would be very comfortable at, at the same dinner table as Henry James. He has a Jamesian sensibility, a Jamesian complexity. And he brings that, and in fact, when I reread recently Colonel Roosevelt, I thought to myself, you know, this is the book 
by a mature writer who has lived various stages of his life, including a romantic outlook and youth, who has been through a lot in life and who has applied all of that. It, it's, it's never a book about Edmund, but it's impossible to separate his portrait of the aging and in some ways diminished T.R. Um, from the lessons, inevitably, that we all learn, um, some of them p more painful than others. How did you get introduced to Bob Dole, and how long did you work for him, and what was he doing at the time? Well, I can tell you exactly. I remember vividly. I was working for Ed Brook in Boston, writing speeches. Former senator. And I knew that, I, I mean, you didn't have to be a genius. I, I knew we were not going to win in 78. He had been elected originally in 66, overwhelmingly re-elected in 72. And then on 78, um, first of all, the Republican Party was changing, even in Massachusetts. Um, you know, the, the conservative uprising, if you will, at the grassroots was making itself felt. Brooke was held to be suspect. Um, I mean, for example, he had a primary challenger, uh, a talk show radio host named Avi Nelson. And uh, the cutting edge issue was the Panama Canal treaties. Hmm. And, 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 and in many ways, this was a forerunner of things to come in the Republican Party, including the Republican Party of Donald Trump. Um, well, anyway, I, uh, in 1978, the primaries in September, we barely won the primary, 53%. And I said, you know, we're going to lose because what had happened? Well, uh, he had gone through a messy divorce. And his daughters sided with their mother and, and, and became sources for the Boston Globe. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it was ugly. And in retrospect, there was a Senate ethics probe. There was a question about um, Medicaid funds, com, you know, pooling. Re anyway, there were a bunch of sort of financial issues. And the, you have to remember, the thing about Ed Brooke was he was not an ordinary politician. You know, in 1960, 1964... When Lyndon Johnson carried Massachusetts by over a million votes, and Ed Brooke was elected as Attorney General by like 700,000 votes, I mean, the biggest ticket splitting in the history of the state, Ed Brooke made people feel good about the process and about themselves for, for electing an African American uh, to the Senate, the first since Reconstruction, the first popularly elected. African American in the Senate, and and yet it, to me, it was evidence of Brooks' integrity. Um, he never wanted to be the black senator. Um, he chose to be in the Housing Committee, which is not a high visibility, but it's something he really cared about. And in fact, something called the Brooke Amendment um, is historic. It it. It imposed a 25% limit on the income of those who were living in public housing. They, they could not be charged more than 25% of their income, whatever it was. He was a constructive legislator. He understood that he also was a symbol. I don't think even he appreciated the, the fact that the plain fact is that people expected more of Brooke. And so that the, 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 the slightest breath of scandal, even if, in retrospect, for example, the Senate Ethics Committee cleared him. But, you know, the damage had been done. So I, I knew, I remember saying on the primary night, we're going to lose 55-45 to Paul Songus, who was a very uh, decent, admirable congressman from Lowell, um, who won, as it happened, about 55, 45 in November. So I was at, without a, a job, or about to be without a job. That's what you don't want to be when you're young. I mean, the irony is only you, you learn later on that you have sufficient, whatever it is, to get through 
things like that. But you don't know it at the time. All you know is, my God, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, without a job. I don't have any money. I mean, what am I going to do? And, you know, we're all going to be tossed out of this office in seven weeks. So it's a, it was a test. I do remember vividly saying to my, because we had to keep up, buck up our spirits, you know. And I was sort of the, the jester. And uh, I said, look, we have to go find someone who's more depressed than we are. So, the idea was to go find murder trials in the nearby courthouse for lunch and sit, you know, and, and feel better, you know, that, that there were people who were worse off than us. Uh, and there were lots of people who were worse off than us. But anyway, but you don't know that at the time. Okay. Well, I was very lucky. Ed Brooke, to his eternal credit, I certainly will always be grateful to him. Um, made some calls, and one of the people we called was Bob Dole. It was really interesting, something, Ed Brooke, Bob Dole, you think, well, opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, kind of stylistically, very, what do they have in common? They both lived at the Watergate, but they're good friends. And that was the first hint to me that Bob Dole was not necessarily the Bob Dole of the 76 campaign, the kind of, the caricature, the Democrat wars, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. Beggars can't be choosers. I, I got a call to come down to Washington and meet with the senator. And, I, you know, he was apparently looking for a speechwriter. And um, the AA was a man named Rich Armitage, who would go on to bigger and better things in a certain notoriety in this town. Uh, the State in, Department, among other things. Yeah, the State Department, Exactly. And uh, anyway, I'd never met Bob Dole, and I didn't know much about him, to be honest with you, except the little, I, you know. But anyway, I remember I went into his office, and we talked, I don't know, we talked maybe 20 minutes. I won't say it was perfunctory, I, I, but it was, it was not a searching examination on either side, you know. And, um, of course, he was busy, uh, so I wasn't surprised. So anyway, so I, I left. And I went downstairs, I remember, I went down to the cafeteria. And 20 minutes after I left, Rich Armitage showed up and says, he wants to hire you. And I don't know, to this day, I have no idea. I, you know, but anyway, any event, talk about chance. So, so I was actually one of the lucky ones. I, within two weeks of election day, I had a job. So um, it meant... Moving every lock, stock, and barrel, I didn't have much. I mean, but I mean, moving to Washington, D.C., which I did with the help of a, you all. Um, and um, that you didn't drive. Which I did not drive. My sister, my older sister, uh, was good enough to drive. And um, anyway, so January 1979, and then before the month. I had tickets for a show at Ford's Theater on the 26th, 27th, the weekend, and Nelson Rockefeller died. And I remember, you know, it was, it was, it was odd. It was the juxtaposition of I'd left Massachusetts, which was home, and a place that I felt and still feel attachment to. I mean, I think of Massachusetts is, is unlike any other place. And it's, you know, it's home. And I had left that for this kind of, I didn't know what. And my God, I was so green, you know. And I had so much to learn. I was very lucky because in their own way, each, both Brooke and Dole were wonderful teachers. And that that's not universal, I have found, in political figures. I mean, you know, you're expected to on day one, you know, to, to be up to their standards and meet their expectations. And it's not up to them to adapt to you. It's quite, quite the opposite. Well, but in fact, you know, it's not that they adapted to me, they, but they were willing to take the time. They didn't dismiss. They didn't throw away. They, they you know, in, in very gently, I mean, with, you know, I, I, I mean, and the class act. Two, two, I mean, very different in many ways. But I, I consider myself really incredibly fortunate. But teaching you what? 
what works in a speech. Um, when a speech is too long, when a speech is too discursive. Um, What's the optimum length for a speech? Oh, gosh. Now you have to remember, the two different... Uh, they were both, as a rule, they were more comfortable speaking off the cuff. But that didn't matter. I mean, in some cases, you wrote a text as a security blanket. And both, and they both learned, I will say this, because we, we, we evolved together. Um, they both, <laughs> as I got better, they got more comfortable sticking to the script. And it became almost a, even after I left full-time employment of the door office, I would get called back on the emotional speeches, the eulogies, uh, the, you know, those, the sort of, where you needed to sound like a statesman sort of thing. And uh, 20 minutes is a, you know, you don't want to, you certainly don't want to. And again, remember, thanks to television, now the Internet, the attention span, it's the amazing shrinking attention span. So now, I mean, television covers, to the extent it covers, I mean, you, you look at how the sound bite has shrunk over the last 20 years or so. Well, speeches and the content of speeches. Um, you know, and of course, Dole had this marvelous sense of humor, which had its downside because it could cover if, if you know, if you weren't prepared for an audience. Well, that's all right. He could always get away with, he could entertain them. He could make them laugh. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.